Well, welcome everyone to Family of Christ. It's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, if you're joining us just for the first time, uh, we're right in the middle of what's called the Red Letter Challenge. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the actual words that Jesus taught and spoke in the Bible that are often in your Bibles, the color red. And tonight we're talking about the topic of forgiveness. Today is uh, day number 16. And uh, hopefully each and every day you're not only reading the section, but following through on the challenge. Let's make our beginning tonight in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Really the only thing to announce to you before we look at tonight's confession is just uh, continue to pray for our team that's down in El Paso, Texas, in Juarez, Mexico, building a house and doing all sorts of mission activities. Those 17 people will be back by next Sunday. Please join me in our confession tonight. Let's read this responsibly. Lord, we daily seek your mercy, yet repeatedly look for payback when we're wrong. Lord, too often we think it's right and fair to retaliate and use harsh words and withdraw from others. Lord, we're eager to do your judging and often carry a grudge over petty issues. Forgive us, Lord, for the sins we conceal and overlook in our hearts. Look with me now at Psalm 103, various verses beginning with verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. You see, because of what Jesus has already done for us through his life, death, and resurrection, your sins are fully forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, tonight the whole service is about forgiving. And one of the greatest uh, examples of forgiveness in God's word is recorded in Psalm 51. And remember, this took place after King David had been caught had confessed his adulterous affair with Bathsheba, and he did all this through the prophet Nathan. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all of my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Here ends the word of our Lord. Let's watch together now the sermon video and we're gonna be looking tonight at the very last few verses of Matthew chapter 18 for tonight's video, or tonight's message. Here's a story about a man, a neighbor, and a gnome. Harold sat face to face with his accountant as they discussed how he might recover from the financial mess that was his life. I'm horrible at finances. You did make quite a compelling case at court. Harold's case about his home loan and back taxes were in fact more pathetic than compelling. But thankfully the judge had more important things to do. The judge has encouraged the bank not to offer your house on the courthouse steps. Harold, I've noticed you're planning on purchasing a rather expensive boat. You need to start saving money. Are there any assets you have that come to mind? My garden gnome collection. In Harold's backyard stood a very special limited collection of garden gnomes, handcrafted in Hohenems, Austria. Each one with his own little unique hat and beard, they portray the seven dwarves. Unfortunately to Harold, these are all worthless in all parts of the world, except to those who live in Hohenems. 
currently, Harold has completely forgotten that he has let his neighbor borrow one. Sneezy. Then Harold had a revelation. I'm putting it in a pool. That way I don't need a boat. I'll bring the water to me. I think you failed to see the point here. Not at all. I can liquidate these guys in the blink of a hat. I already found a buyer in Hohemis on eBay. Can you believe that? I just wish these guys were worth a little more so we could pay our debt off. But they'll pay for the pool, though. But if we spend the money on a pool, won't we lose the house? I need to go out and hit some links and think more about it. Even though Harold was infamous for being the worst golfer in the Tri-County area, it did actually help him think from time to time. Neo, nice day, huh? Oh, yeah. How are things shaking down at the court? Kind of tough, I imagine. Ah, oh, not bad, not bad. Just a little mix-up is all. Huh. Anyway, about that gnome I loaned you. What? The gnome? Oh, yeah. My relatives are going to be really surprised when they show up from Hohamnets tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, hold up. I only need this for a week. I need to ship this tomorrow. Ship it next week. It'll take a week to get there. Then ship it overnight. If I sip it overnight, then I wouldn't be able to afford the water slide. Then buy a diving board. No. Yes. <laughs> Harold. This is the exact moment when Harold starts to reflect on his situation. Every leniency has been given you, and this is how you behave? Harold, your home will be offered up to pay your defunct loan. And at the end of the day, I shall see to it that your creditors eat up any other assets you may have. And I shall see to it personally that your neighbor gets all your gnomes. At that moment, Harold realized that if he had settled for a diving board instead of a water slide, well, then maybe his neighbor could have had that guard gnome for one more week. Well, the man was in debt up to his eyeballs. He owed the king an enormous amount of money. So he wasn't surprised to receive a note summoning him to the palace. And when he finally got there, he was ushered before the king who opened his ledger and said, it's time to settle accounts. You owe me 10,000 talents, and I want my money right now. And the servant's response was, um, Your Majesty, I don't have 10,000 talents. And by the way, who does? That's the equivalent of billions of dollars today. So the king demanded the man, his wife, his children, and all of their possessions be sold in order to recoup at least some of his assets. But the servant fell on his knees and he began to plead these words of Matthew 18, verse 26. Be patient with me and I will pay back everything. Have mercy on me. Just give me a little time. And amazingly, the king gave him far more than time. He ripped his page out of his ledger, crumpled it up, throw, threw it away and said, I forgive your entire debt. You're now free and clear. Go in peace. Can you imagine the utter joy, the relief, the elation and ecstasy of that moment? With newfound freedom, that man must have floated out of that palace with a transformed attitude, outlook, and future. Well, maybe not. For inexplicably, just a few minutes after mercifully being set free from all of that massive debt, he spots a guy who owes him just a hundred bucks. He grabs him by the throat and look at what he says to him in verse 28. Pay back what you owe me. And just like the servant had done earlier before the king, this second fellow also falls on his knees and pleads these words of verse 29. He says, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But that turkey refused. He didn't give him more time. He didn't give him anything. 
Instead, he called the police and had that man thrown into jail for not paying his bills. And the bystanders couldn't believe what they had just seen. So they quickly informed the king, and he once again summons that heartless servant before him. And notice what he says this time, verses 32 and 33. He says, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And then he continues, I have news for you, says the king. That jail cell where your, body, where your buddy sits is a suite for two. Guards, send this man there until he pays back his 10,000 talent debt. And as far as we know, he's still there today. Well, keep in mind, when Jesus told this story, the entire Roman Empire, including all of their wealth, possessions, coliseums, amphitheaters, aqueducts, armies, roads, you name it, all of it com combined wasn't worth 10,000 talents. So as the crowd heard Jesus tell this story about one guy who not only owed that much, but also begged for just a little more time to pay off his debt, they all were busting a gut. They were chuckling, snickering. Why? Because nobody, even in a thousand lifetimes, could ever pay off that balance. Sound familiar? It should, because Romans 3 verse 23 declares this powerful statement. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To sin means to fall short. So when we're worrying, we're falling short on trust. When we're angry, we're, following, we're falling short on love. When we lust, we're falling short on purity. When we're impatient, we're falling short on persistence and self-control. And when we're envious, we're falling short on contentment. So who could possibly count the number of times you and I have fallen short in our thoughts, our words, our actions throughout our lifetime? Our sin debt to holy God is not only immeasurable, it's also impossible to settle. We're living in a lake superior personal sin debt that we could never, ever possibly repay. And along with this, if I ask you to raise your hand tonight, if you've been wronged, wounded, used, abused, mistreated, victimized, or had your heart broken so severely it still weighs on you today, I'm certain every hand would go up everywhere. So just like the servant in today's parable, sometimes we're begging for forgiveness, and at other times the Holy Spirit is nudging us to mercifully offer forgiveness to others. Perhaps you've seen this quote from famous pastor and author Tim Keller. We're more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we would ever dare to believe, yet at the same time we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. What Jesus did for us on Calvary's cross is completely selfless and beyond our understanding. Jesus got us out of our eternal mess that we could never, ever repay. It's only through his perfect sacrifice that our sin debt has been paid in full. And through faith in the Savior Jesus, we're now fully forgiven, completely absolved, and at perfect peace with God. So how could someone, knowing their titanic sin debt has been cleansed, that their eternal death sentence has been lifted, that their deep-seated guilt is daily loosened, we're set free from it, how could that person refuse to forgive others? Clearly, grace receivers should be grace givers. Those who have been forgiven much should forgive much. So ultimately, look at this statement. Forgiveness not shown means Jesus' forgiveness isn't really known. And until we forgive others, we end up torturing ourselves. You know what I mean. Grudge bears become early grave diggers because resentment causes ulcers, high blood pressure, depression, headaches, chest pain, and tense muscles. And we can go on and on. Grudges cause our hearts to race, our moodiness to swell, and our joy to be siphoned. They cause sleepless night after sleepless night. They multiply as we stew over every rotten thing someone ever said or did to us in the past. 
And as long as we nurse those old wounds and refuse to forgive, we're allowing wrongdoers to keep controlling and confining us today. Isn't it far better to let go and move on? Forgiveness doesn't mean that we approve of what others did to us or pretend that in some way they didn't hurt us. No, forgiveness means we do the same thing that Jesus did while dangling from Calvary's cross. Look at how this is described in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. When they hurled their insults at Jesus, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him, the Heavenly Father, who judges justly. Likewise, we place the people and the wrongs that they did to us into the hands of our merciful Heavenly Father, and we let him take care of it. We make the deliberate choice to not fixate and stew over what others did to us. Instead, we move forward by God's grace and do exactly what he does. According to Jeremiah 31, verse 34, I will forgive their wickedness. Now notice this last phrase. And will remember their sins no more. Will you also make that same deliberate choice? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the power of your full forgiveness. Please give us the wisdom and strength to forgive those who have hurt us. We want our life to be a living illustration of your unconditional love and unending forgiveness. Help me to bless and forgive others just as you have forgiven me. And Lord, give us the courage to lovingly speak to those who have sinned against us, who've done us wrong. Help us know how to gently tell others what they did and then kindly ask them not to do it again. And if they repent and say they're sorry, well then help us to forgive them, to let them free, to loosen that situation. Then release them to completely, whatever the grievances, the old hurts that we have, to cast that aside, to place that in your hands, and you take care of it. Then help us to put that offense out of our minds forever, just as you have done so many times for us. All of this we ask in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the presence, the peace of the Holy Spirit be and remain with you always. God's richest blessings to you as we continue to, again, trudge through this season of Lent by God's grace, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep hanging in daily in the Red Letter Challenge because as we do this, God's not only going to change our hearts and lives, but also the lives of those that he brings into our lives each day.